Hi everyone. Jung is well known for his concept of the anima and the animus, but in almost every case when an individual comes to study this topic, they are at the very least confused and more than likely totally consciously lost, or unconsciously reducing the concept down to a pure psychologism, away from Darwin and certainly away from genetics. Steve and Pauline Richards, who you guys know from the Young to Live By channel, emphasise the primacy of the anima and the animus in the therapeutic process through their clinical psychophysiological model, Psychosystems Analysis, which was supported by many notable clinicians and individuals, including Dr. Anthony Stevens, Dr. Ernest Rossi, Professor George Engel, and Franz Jung, Carl Jung's only son. However, the anima and the animus should be, and are, reframed into being the relating function, to demystify this vital component of the psyche away from Carl Jung, the man's personal myth. In this video, I will be narrating a section from the upcoming personal myth guide, all about this relating function, which is now less than two weeks away from release. You can pick up your copy of this over 300 A4 page handbook filled with solid gold practical knowledge and beautiful diagrams through the link in the description. It's the distillation of over 80 combined years of clinical experience between Steve and Pauline and indeed the entire depth psychology canon for the purposes of what Carl Jung called individuation. The section I'm about to read out covers two main overlapping topics the psychodynamics of the anima, and how one can distill their anima type. An understanding of both of these is one of the prime and the most efficacious self-development exercises a man can do, as they will reveal to him how he has been unconsciously relating to himself and to others throughout his entire life. The crucial factor in psychosocial adaptation and releasing genomic potential. A similar video on the animus for women will follow soon, and a full breakdown of this will also be included in the personal myth guide. We really hope that you enjoy and gain great utility from the personal myth guide, the contents within which will form the backbone of Young to Live By for 2021. And so having a copy at hand to reference will be indispensable to your proper study of Steve and Pauline's work. Thank you everyone. And without any further ado, here is the relating function. Jung's concept of the anima and the animus as the female component of the male psyche and the male component of the female psyche, respectively, is re-envisioned here based on developments since his time in genetics, neuroscience, neuropsychoanalysis, systems thinking, and applied clinical empiricism. The core of the relating function is the genomic self, which is the whole genome of an individual, but specifically its organizing principle which regulates the physical and psychological dimensions of lifespan development in a social world. This correlates with Jung's concept of the self, but acknowledges its foundation in the genome and avoids Jung's otherwise psychological reductionism. Jung believed that the anima in a man was the result of men having, quote, a minority of female genes, end quote. Similarly, that the animus in women was the result of their having a minority of male genes. This is now known to be untrue. Jung was very ambiguous over the definitions and boundaries for his concepts, and with the anima animus, this was very much in evidence. For example, the anima's role and development is not adequately separated from that of the mother complex, or from early attachments. It's also generalised out to refer to the whole of a man's unconscious, which, if it were true, would mean that a man's psyche is overwhelmingly female, as the unconscious is many times larger than consciousness. Obviously, as with Jung's belief that men had a minority of female genes that determined the anima, this is not the case. Jung had similar issues with his concept of the shadow, which he variously described as being the shadow cast by the ego, the entirety of the personal unconscious, which includes memory and learning, or the whole of the unconscious beyond even that, which reveals the further potential conflation between the anima animus and the shadow in Jung's model of the psyche. Jung's evidence for the existence of the anima animus, as with all quote-unquote archetypes, was the appearance of common symbols, myths, religious ideas, and art in many cultures throughout history, and the parallel appearance of these in the contents of delusions and fantasies in psychotic and schizophrenic patients, as well as in neurotic and normal people. The diagram on screen is the first in this section of the personal myth guide, and it's called Relating Function 1, Projection. 
The unconscious anima component of the male relating system is projected onto the female, who reciprocally projects the unconscious animus component of her relating system onto the male, creating mutual fantasy relatedness. Fantasy relatedness is not a concept we've gone into much detail on before on the Young to Live By channel, and one might think that fantasy relatedness is a bad or suboptimal thing. However, it is important insofar as it bonds people, which is normal and healthy. As if one thinks about it, relatedness is mostly fantasy based anyway, as we don't know people very well. Thus, the simple diagram on screen, which is fairly intuitive, shows how the anima or the animus is projected initially in order to immediately bond people together. His conclusion was that these were manifestations of a collective layer to the unconscious mind, which he called the collective unconscious which was innate or inherited and common therefore to all, composed of archetypes as the structural unit of this inherited psyche. Archetypes, he suggested, had two dimensions, the archetype in itself, which was unknowable, and the archetypal image, which was the expression of the archetype that was found in culture, as well as appearing spontaneously in the conscious mind of individuals as dreams, fantasies, visions, and even creativity. The archetype in itself was held to be virtual, that is, without definite form or content, and was fleshed out by personal and cultural experience, hence the archetypal image and the local variations thereof. At different times, Jung tried to link and then to separate his concept of archetypes from what were understood in his day to be instincts. Instincts were considered from a philosophical and religious perspective to be animalistic and base, and not indicative of higher human potential and therefore certainly not of the human soul. For Jung, however, archetypes could, and did, suggest a spiritual dimension to the psyche. Jung's split with Freud in 1913 also necessitated some distance from the main ideas associated with Freud. Freud was known to champion the role of instinct in human motivation and development, as instincts and human development were understood at his time. Jung's development of his archetypal hypothesis needs to be considered at least in part as a reaction against Freud in this respect. Reciprocally, Freud had been a supporter of the theory of complexes, as developed at the Burke Holsley Hospital by Jung and others through word association and psychophysiological testing. After the split, complexes were too closely associated with Jung's theories, and Freud's work began to progressively disinclude them, beyond the Oedipus and Electra complex and the castration complex. Jung's archetypes eventually morphed from being a hypothesized biological substrate for a cultural phenomena into reified, or made real, personalities and characters that lived an autonomous, independent life inside the minds of everyone, as if animated homunculi shaping fate in like kind to classical Greek gods. Pop psychologists, internet gurus, and social media entrepreneurs still push this, as indeed do some Jungian analysts. Such is the enormous inductive power of how archetypes are presented that as a concept they're now attracting a cult-like following, particularly among a global demographic of vulnerable young men who feel disenfranchised and emasculated. There's an almost pathological resistance in them to analysing Jung's archetypal hypothesis critically. Clinically, outside of the extended, up to many times a week for several years, Jungian analytical relationship, archetypes have no relevance at all, except where they can be seen in manifest form, as psychosocial and cultural influences on an individual's living context. Cultural narratives, myths, novels, and recently films, television, and streaming have all had a valid role to play in communicating the collective wisdom accumulated by previous generations. But what passed for archetypes in popular culture are typically individual characters who, like actors in a movie, read the lines written for them by the screenwriter and perform an interpretation under the guidance of a director on behalf of a producer. What is not generally appreciated is that archetypes are whole situations, as Jung himself said. The characters are interchangeable, hence local variations in myths and the representation of gods in, in religion. However, take a Greek hero or god out of their context, which would be their narrative, and they become non-playable characters, or NPCs. Jung said that, quote, the archetype or primordial image might suitably be described as the instinct's perception of itself, 
or as the self-portrait of the instinct, in exactly the same way as consciousness is an inward perception of the objective life process. This comes from Collected Works 8, paragraph 277. Here, Jung makes it plain that so-called archetypes are produced by instincts. To return to our filmmaking analogy above, the producer is more appropriately understood as the genome, which is the repository and regulator of everything that we are in potential, and as that potential actualizes itself in the world. The screenwriter represents the specific instinct, the script, from the genome. The director is the instinctive drive, libido, literally directed into the world with intentionality towards completion. The actor is the agent of completion of this drive and its intentionality. It's entirely appropriate to see the actor as representative of ourselves, of our personality and intentionality, but it's also right to understand that the whole situation, the narrative, was created by a producer who instructed a screenwriter to deliver an actionable script, to a director who then purposely and intentionally guided the actor to completion. The actors, if they are indeed archetypes, neither produce, author, deliver or direct the instructions to act in the world. That is the role of the instincts, and of the genome. In psychosystems analysis, the genome is the foundation of the entire biopsychosocial system that makes up a human being and their ecology. As such, it is the regulating system for lifespan development, with each significant phase of growth and maturation being both anticipated and controlled for by the timed release of biological change and psychosocial development. Relating is the key. The relating function, or Jung's anima animus, is present immediately from birth as a platonic representational system. Jung's archetype and acts under the direction of instinct directly from the genome, or genomic self. The anima and animus complexes develop over our lifespan as relating system components of the relating function which includes the genome, the platonic representational form, all relevant pansepian instinctual systems, and the relating complex, anima or animus. The diagram on screen shows layers of resolution to the relating function. It starts with the genomic nucleus, which then above it clusters the mother imago, which then above is the attachment drive and imprinting, which then all intends to act out in the social world. The genome contains the biogrammar of the human species, the adaptive instructions for survival and lifespan development. Relating is the vital first step in survival for the infant. An innate virtual image or imago of the mother is released by the genome together with an attachment drive which intends imprinting by the child onto its mother. This primary relationship is anticipated genetically and forms the basis for all subsequent relating. The relating function is foundational for the development of what Jung called the anima in males and the animus in females. The dynamic core of this relating function is instinctual and manifests firstly through the developing mother complex. The diagram on screen shows the scope of the operation of the relating function. All four of the layers interact with one another in two directions. You can consider this to be a snapshot of the relating function. We are all as human beings intended to thrive and survive in the green phase, the social world, and all of this is anticipated in the genome. There is of course a bandwidth within all of this for adaptation and frustration. It starts at the genome and then ends at manifestation in the social world, where the social world can also provide feedback back to that genomic nucleus. However, you will also get resultant effects or adaptations that we are conscious or unconscious of. The relating function includes Jung's so-called anima and animus, the feminine component of the male psyche and the masculine component of the female psyche, respectively. The relating function is innate, genomic, and instinctive, and follows a pattern of development that is anticipated biologically. It becomes projected onto the opposite biological sex for these reasons, and is set to facilitate survival through mating and relating. Relating, therefore, includes internal relating through introspection and development of the personality, individuation, and of course all social adaptations that permit survival and reproduction. The diagram on screen is best summed up by the quote, what is within, so too is without. In practice, the way a man treats women externally in his psychosocial relationships is essentially identical to how he treats his unconscious mind, internally. 
If a man is afraid of an outer woman, or treats them with contempt, he will likewise fear his own psyche, and treat it with contempt. The same is true for women. Their inner relationship to their psyche and their psychosocial relationship to men are most often identical. The remedy for this is an increase in consciousness. Hence, what is within, so too is without. The relating function and its actionable relating system can be mapped through the five personal myth confirmation stages. The graphic that you can see on screen covers 11 data points in the mapping process across the five stages, starting with birth, moving through childhood and adolescence into adulthood. The personal myth process allows a careful assessment of our individual progress through these stages. And here it's with special reference to the relating function. As seen in the diagram on screen, the relating function is present immediately from birth. Then the ego is formed, and then confirmation from the mother takes place. Then the moral complex, or Freud's superego, forms, and the shadow, or in psychosystems analysis, the alter ego, forms. The mother is the initial environment that the child is contained in, where everything forms. Then the father mediates relating to the outside world. After that, peer group confirmation can and should occur. Then there is an adolescent transition, social interest, life partner confirmation, and ultimately, finally, self-confirmation. All of these stages are covered in great detail in the Personal Myth document. So if you would like to read more about this, make sure you pick up your copy. Tracking the anima is tracking the development of both the relating function and its relating system through the timeline of our lifespan development. The diagram on screen now represents a generic example of how the anima develops in relation to the personal myth. Working through this carefully and then applying the framework to your own life will be instructive. The diagram that you see is too complicated to go into in a video like this, but in the personal myth guide it is fully explicated, and indeed in an IPSA seminar for Carter 1 or Group 1 of our students, we spend about 4 hours covering just this one diagram. It is that essential. Part two, distilling your anima type. This next part of the video, and indeed the personal myth guide, will show you how to become conscious of the platonic form of the feminine within your psyche, presuming you are a man, and how this has secretly guided your relating, both inner and outer, all of your life. There is a similar situation for women, the animus type, which is covered in great detail in the personal myth guide, and indeed will be explicated in a future Young to Live By video. The platonic form of the anima type refers here to the innate representational system that prefigures and anticipates male experience of the feminine out in the psychosocial and natural world. Following Jung, this is conceived of as a virtual image, without definite form as such, but with a set of qualities that are released instinctively, and then met with and confirmed psychosocially. This produces a very specific anima type, which is unique to the individual, but which at the same time contains the original archetypal imprint from the genome. Jung borrowed the term archetype from Plato, who used the term interchangeably with that of form. There are nuances that can separate archetype from form, but here is used in the sense that Plato intuited the concept of form, an archetype, in a way that Jung later attempted his own conceptualization of, to mean a primordial image that is virtual and present as an archetype in the psyche of humankind. Jung's archetypal theory became elaborated and separated out from his early emphasis on experimental psychology, biology and medicine into metaphysics. Its use in psychosystems analysis and in the personal myth process returns to Plato's intuition of something outside of normal perception that seems to represent a universal pattern or configuration, somehow involved in the material, physical, instantiation, manifestation, of whatever it is that the form represents archetypally. Plato believed that the form of something was an idealized blueprint so that every copy of that in the material world was an imperfect version of this pure or archetypal pattern, projected into physical being. In this context, the platonic form of the feminine would represent a blueprint from which any, indeed all, individual women could be derived or distilled. Plato's intuition was very likely informed by an unconscious understanding that, in what we conceive of now as biology, there was a form, in this case, for the feminine, both as a psychological factor and as a physical woman. 
Plato did not know about the genome, and his understanding of psychology was limited by the capacities of the philosophical systems of the day, notably, in his case, dialectics. Given Plato's intuition, and Jung's later elaboration away from hard science, Jung's archetype of the anima is here referred to as the platonic form of the feminine relating function, and, put firmly into the context of biology, the logos of life and its human genome. We'll now look at the process of distillation that occurs largely unconsciously across a man's lifespan development, as he encounters manifestations of the platonic form of the feminine projected onto real women in the psychosocial world, and as internal resultant images that arise and take specific form in his psyche, to populate and illustrate his journey through life in dreams, fantasies, relationships, as all that is generative in his being, and all too, that is destructive. All men know, for as Plato said, all knowledge is remembering. The relating function for men is different in kind than that for women. Men are born from the opposite biological sex, whereas for women, it's from the same sex. For a girl, the first caring and nurturing relationship is with their own gender. A mother's love should provide confirmation of her daughter as being like her, but separate. For a boy, however, that mother's love confirms him to be both different to his mother and separate. Jung's understanding of that part of the relating function and system, that he called the anima, highlights the otherness of the feminine, as experienced by an infant boy. His attachment to the mother, or mother figure, is instinctive and forms the basis for all subsequent relationships, including his inner relationship to his self-concept and to his unconscious mind. The primal role for the mother is to provide a safe, loving and nurturing family environment within which the child feels valued and confirmed. For a boy, this is foundational for his emerging sense of self and the basis for him to accept his nascent identity as male and to be free enough from the containment by his mother in order to turn to his father for further confirmation. Learning about the challenges of the wider psychosocial and natural world. These primordial facts of early attachment and confirmation are deeply ingrained in the genome and play out via the timed release and expression of instinct, regardless of any transient cultural fashion that may be superimposed upon it. The anima for a young boy thus represents the first conscious psychosocial split that he will experience. His relating function and its developing relating system, or his anima complex, was prefigured in his genome, and through instinctive attachment contained the imagos of both of his parents as a relating duality within himself. His father representing the anticipation of his future development as a man in waiting. His mother in her role representing the embodiment of relatedness and the anticipation of the confirmation of his biological nature by the collective feminine. As a child, he'll be conscious of the split in his relating function, but the true nature of it remains at an instinctive level of awareness. For a girl, the early, and from a Freudian-based perspective, erotic, attachment to the same-sex parent has consequences that for boys do not arise. Girls are born of women, so too are boys. The boy's first caring and erotic attachment is onto the parent of the opposite sex. A very interesting psychosocial experiment to run is to ask men to imagine how their relationship to their father and to the male sex in general would have been different had their father been their birth parent. This often shocks men into the realization that the relating function and system in women develops very differently with psychosexual and consequent psychosocial effects that they had never considered. Freud considered this to be part of the Oedipal and Electra stage of development, specifically when a girl's affection is transferred in proto-erotic form, away from the mother and onto the father. However, that original primal attachment to the same-sex parent persists, evidence in the deeply emotional and often erotic relationships that girls have with their own sex. For boys, the resolution or otherwise of the Oedipal attachment to his mother will shape his subsequent relationship to girls, and eventually to women. If his mother has been too containing, or even sexually possessive, the boy's anima can become frozen at the Oedipal stage, despite instinctive pressure to separate. His relating function through the principle of, quote, what is within, so too is without, end quote, will internalize this paralyzing possession by the mother and affects both his inner relationship to himself and his outer relationships to women, to society, culture, and even to the natural world. 
So a boy's, and therefore a man's, anima complex will be the template for interpreting the psychosocial world. This is anticipated by the genome, hence the instinctual attachments and roles that prefigure psychosocial development. To the extent that a boy, and later a man, remains unconscious of this dynamic, his anima-relating complex is decisive in shaping his personal myth. This, then, is anamnesis, which is, in the depth psychology sense, access to the far memory of the original platonic form of the feminine, first released as a projection onto the birth mother. A literal memory? No, but an intuition, a feeling or affect that links a man via instinct to the anticipation of what was, or should, have been. The template originating in the genome, and then fleshed out by ongoing experience of the feminine, is that from which a man on his quest to uncover his personal myth may thus distill the remembrance of his anima type. We now turn to the actual process of distilling the anima type, a weaving of the thread. Ask any man to recall his first awareness of attraction to girls, and he'll probably remember immediately. Where this does not happen, or if recall does not start until middle to late teens, then it's likely that some of his memories of childhood have been repressed, or otherwise quite normally forgotten. If they've been repressed, it may indicate that some wound or trauma that affected the development of his relating system occurred well before his first recalled memory of interest in, or attraction to, girls. This may not be the case, but the possibility must be considered. The psyche uses autobiographical memories as nodal points of attention, either directly, as in drawing our conscious recall to a particular memory, or indirectly, by repressing access to the memory. The repression creates a negative attention to the times, situations, or events that can't be recalled. In effect, they're conspicuous by their absence. Gaps in memory are usual, of course, and may have no significance as such. The process of actively associating memories and emotions often brings about the recollection of things previously forgotten. There's also the possibility of false memory syndrome, which must always be considered. The psyche is creative and can associate or even produce memories that did not happen, and these can block or otherwise cover up the recall of real, actual memories. Weaving the thread can start at any recall point. For our purposes, we will assume a normal memory process, which will involve an increasing volume of memories and associations as engagement with the personal myth continues. First memories of attraction often lead back to early school days, sometimes before. There's usually no explicitly sexual content, but there is certainly interest, fascination, and attraction. The prefigured intentionality of the relating function is to prepare boys for the adaptive task of puberty and adolescence. These early attachments to girls hint to him the shape of his adult future as a man in waiting. So deeply hardwired is this that it instinctively causes him to refer back to a model provided by his parents or caregivers. As the relating function develops into a boy's specific relating system, his personal anima complex in Jungian terms, the inherited platonic form of the relating function, Jung's anima archetype, begins to take shape through projection of the virtual platonic form onto the real girls he meets, blended with elements, either positive or negative, that he transfers from his personal experience of his mother and other significant female caregivers in his life. Jung's mother archetype and complex. Jung was not a systematic thinker in the sense that he integrated or finalised his model of the psyche. The distinction between his anima and mother archetypes is very unclear, both theoretically and practically. Each, however, are clearly elements of the relating function, grounded in the intentionality of the genome and expressed through the drive to relate. Relating is biological, psychological and social, with, quote, mate and relate, end quote, being a priori to any psychological consideration that is not in service to these innate and fundamental imperatives. The young boy's developing psyche, then, has to contend with the task of relating, both to the anticipatory demands of his biology and to the psychosocial world. Without him even being conscious of it, this process also shapes his sense of self and his relationship to his inner world. In the context of the personal myth, the girls and later the women he is attracted to take on a very significant role in the development of his personality. Jung referred to the anima as a soul image, which is meaningful in the sense that boys experience the affect or emotion attached to these projections they make onto these girls. 
It is now understood in affective neuroscience and in neuropsychoanalysis that affect is the bridge between instinct and ego consciousness, with the emotion signalling a deep structure need that is seeking fulfilment of itself. The numinous quality Jung ascribed to the anima as a consciously experienced image places it very firmly in the category of instinct, with all the compulsive and fascinating power that arises out from the genome. Beginning with recall of the earliest girl he was attracted to, the adult man, distilling his anima, should note aspects of appearance, not just in an obvious physical sense, but also in terms of her movement and perceived felt energy. This should start with his perceptions, literally his sense impressions of the girl, and then his own feelings, perhaps emotionally and certainly compulsively, with a desire to look at her being prominent. This is the snapshot taken through his eyes, and the simultaneous unconscious comparison made between her and the virtual image within. The product of this snapshot and inner image is confirmation by projection. The resultant effect is attraction. Attraction then further attracts other latent elements, both directly from the genome, via instinct, and from previous personal experience of the feminine, the complex. The platonic form of the feminine is virtual, just as Jung said of his anima archetype. The biological imperative for this is to provide a basis for successful mating and relating that is wide enough for reproduction to occur. In other words, a bandwidth of potential mates should be attractive enough and viable enough for mating with. This optimizes adaptation to the available gene pool. However, there is a built-in genomic regulator that provides for the stability of the bandwidth of acceptable mates. There should be a baseline of attraction that makes reproduction more likely in a genetically competitive struggle for survival. Hence, the average woman is attractive enough to the average man. This is the basis for the virtual quality of the platonic form, and Jung's archetype of the anima. It appears in consciousness as something immediately attractive and interesting. Plato's original intuition about his theory of forms was certainly grounded in the innate knowledge that there was an image, in this case of the feminine, that was universal, collective, and outside of personal experience. It exists a priori, and in that sense is independent of any specific woman, but also paradoxically stands for all of them as an archetype, coming from Jung. The platonic form of the feminine must be a representation of women, out from which, in its closest approximation to the archetype, it is possible to distill out any woman, or at least any woman who is close enough to the baseline imago that all men carry. The projection and reciprocal imprinting that begins with the first sensory impression of attraction in childhood starts the process of distilling out the personal anima type. So powerful is this because of its fundamental genomic nature that it becomes a lay motif of attraction and relating both internal and external for life. Following the thread woven by the projection of the platonic form will lead a man onwards through all the significant way stations of his life. Jung was clear that in his view, the archetype and therefore the form of the feminine was polarized into positive and negative. It can certainly be modeled in that way, and it has convenience, intellectually, but lived life suggests a far more complicated relationship that dynamically shifts across a bandwidth of impressions, projections, and personal experience. If it was so simple as positive versus negative, it would be far easier to deal with these hypothesized opposites, as they'd be clearly in relief and without the paradox routinely encountered in real relationships. Extremes, as in polarities, do have an easy conditioning effect, and not always a helpful one. Nature will always default to survival advantage, and negative effects condition more readily than positive, pain versus pleasure, and these create avoidance of harmful, even fatal, experiences. As the platonic form distills out into the personal anima type, experiences that are both positive and negative gather around the resolving image. The form in itself should be predominantly positive, as this facilitates mating, hence the powerful positive effects of romantic love and attachment. The negative pole of Jung's anima will be based on some innate representational factors of the feminine, as written into the genome, but they only make sense not as a simple polarity within a single form, but rather as a contradiction to the positive. In this sense, the platonic form of the anima is only positive. The negative pole of Jung's archetype is associated to it, but is something intrinsically separate, albeit as anticipated by the genome. There should be no self-destructive pole to the relating function, whose innate purpose is mating and relating. 
As a system, it must be optimally attuned to its purpose. A biological correlate would be an organ that acted against itself, as in a heart that was continually trying to stop, rather than to beat. Jung's negative pole of the anima will be based on the flexibility of the anima complex to accommodate experiences that are often outside of the optimal intentionality of the form. This has survival value. There will be innate predictions within the genome to prepare for this, but infants do not expect the negative. Their attachment must be optimized for the positive. Where actual experience contradicts the positive, then personal security at the very least is threatened. Multiple adaptive drives and instincts will activate to deal with this as ongoing learning. The resultant experience will have a negative complex as its effect. That plasticity is sufficient in most cases without hypothesizing that the innate form of relating is bipolar within a single relating function. Bipolarity would infer that instincts were negative as much as positive with respect to an individual's best interests. Most people who suffer from the effects of others relating negatively to them suffer from one or more complexes. The relating function will certainly have the competitive interests of the individual encoded within it, and so can and will motivate a person to act negatively towards someone else, if so required. Competition socially, for mating and relating, where men or women undermine one another openly, or as frenemies, is a common example of this. The negative anima, as it may undermine a man from within, is most often therefore a complex based on learning and conditioning, rather than a Jungian archetype as such. The special case of Thanatos, conceived of as a death drive by Freud, or as an instinct purposefully aiming at adaptation to the inevitable biodegradable recycling of the organism back into the environment, is a different, but at some stages of the life cycle, connected process. For a fuller discussion on Thanatos, please pick up the personal myth guide from the link in the description down below. There will also, at some point in the future, be a video on Thanatos appearing on the Young to Live By channel, and we have touched on it briefly in several previous videos. The genomic self mobilizes various instinctive systems in service of the relating function, and these of course operate in and through the development of the relating system, the anima complex in this case. Taken together, they contribute to the apparent polarity of relating, per se. The overall regulation by the genomic self will mean that in those cases when there's an issue with the genome itself, then any innate components of sociopathy, narcissism, psychopathy will all play their part in the development of the relating system too. Continuing with the process of distillation, by following the imagos and experiences that have illustrated a man's relational life, in drawing up a timeline of significant girls and women who have affected him, he can mark out the progress of his personal myth that up to now has been unconscious. What is very likely is that he will see the emergence of a definite type in terms of appearance and of character. Superficial differences may conceal this, but it will be there. The more unconscious a man is of his relating function and system, the more the deep structure elements of his type will be hidden from his awareness. A projection of an anima type onto somebody who turns out to be wrong is often based on the platonic form of the anima, overriding the intrinsic character and personality of the girl or woman who's been projected or transferred onto. Love is blind. The unconscious insistence that the platonic form is quote-unquote real leads men into affairs outside of their marriage or committed relationship. Behind that, of course, are the instincts, with their imperatives to adapt optimally, including the biological mating, Freud, and social relating, Adler, drives. There's a tendency for men and for women to unconsciously romanticise their respective platonic forms, and it's important to understand the mechanisms behind this. Firstly, the form exists latently in the genome as a virtual image. It reaches consciousness as a fact, experienced as either a spontaneous image arising from within, or seeing, meeting, someone who is a suitable enough representation of the virtual image to unconsciously project onto. Note that projection and transference are always unconscious. However, just as frequently, someone we know grows on us by manifesting characteristics that induce the projection. Another example is the simple recognition of our type by reference to past experience, and then preferentially selecting someone for a relationship based on that learned type. In this example, the choice may seem to be just that, fully conscious and aware, but that would be to ignore the history of our projections and transferences, insofar as we remain unconscious of the deep structure platonic form behind all of them. 
humans have the blessing and the curse of an enlarged cerebral cortex. This gives us huge spare capacity with respect to information processing, which is overwhelmingly unconscious, including the instinctive pressure to virtually act out or imagine fantasies about relationships. Many people believe that they create their fantasies. Jung noted that they seem instead to create themselves, out from the unconscious, and ultimately therefore instinctive imperatives originating in the genome. The idealism and romanticism that some of these fantasies take on reveal the platonic form, or where that is not present, simple instincts in crude, unvarnished representation. Following the thread of your anima type from its earliest beginnings will reveal the hidden continuity of your relating system as it shapes your relationships externally to others, and internally to yourself. In being the realisation of the relating function, it serves as the active agent of the genome in the world, the systematic manifestation of instinct. It's the regulator of and the resolution to the shadow. There's a section in the Personal Myth Guide all about tracing the shadow, which has been subtitled The Boyo's Journey. To see more of this, make sure you pick up your copy of the Personal Myth Guide. Its presence punctuates a man's life at every significant nodal point in his development. Every success or failure he has will be connected to this ever-present factor. Its presence is felt in every neurosis and maladaptation, and in every resolution to human suffering. Creativity is the left hand of the relating system. Left-handed insofar as this symbolises the unconscious and the role of the human hand in producing something new through action in the world. The right hand is relating itself, and, as this should be as close as possible to reflexive consciousness, the symbolism of right-handedness is appropriate. Distilling the anima is a conscious process, a true opus and the sine qua non, the not without, of the personal myth, the personal equation, and Jung's model of conscious individuation. Ordinary, natural individuation requires no elevation in consciousness, but relating is still key nevertheless. Everything that happens to us must be mediated through the relating function and its distilled relating system. Everything. Biological, psychological, and psychosocial. Consciously or not, psychoreductively or not, everything relates to everything else. This is systems-based homeostasis, which is regulated by the genome and delivered relationally. Distilling the anima must be seen in its context, which is, as we have said above, the personal myth. The personal myth guide now goes on to include 15 practical steps, key points in the distillation process for uncovering your anima type. To go through all 15 of them here, in as much detail as they deserve, would take far too much time. So in order to access these, make sure you pick up your copy of the personal myth guide. What follows from the guide in the final part of this section is as follows. The above are specimen pointers in engaging with the relating system or anima complex. Once you begin a conscious relationship to the imago of her, you can begin the process of true psychological relationship, either or externally with a real partner or internally with the imago. However, that psychological relationship must of course be understood in its fullest context, which is as emergent from the genome, biology, with the intentionality to be acted out via instinct towards optimal adaptation in the real psychosocial world. This is the distillation of your anima type. The Personal Myth Ultimate Handbook is now available for pre-order. For anyone who has a yearning deep in their very genome to become who they truly feel they should be, this guide is utterly indispensable. Pick up your copy today and make 2021 the year you truly begin to become yourself.